Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. You're going to listen to an interview with Thomas Ripple, where we covered some of the biggest issues of modern farming in Europe, land prices and land access for young regenerative farmers. Thomas is working on a blockchain-based solution and shares his story how he raised over 1 million euros for a community-based agriculture project in Germany to secure their land. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems, while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Welcome to Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered. I'm Kuma Sain, your host. Today I'm talking to Thomas Ripple, biodynamic farmer, passionate about combining his knowledge on agriculture, sustainable business and community building to reconnect city people to farming again. We have much to cover, so let's get started. Welcome, Thomas. Yeah, hi, thanks uh, for inviting me to your podcast. I'm really excited to be here. I've uh, listened to quite a few uh, of your podcasts and you've really had some of the most fantastic people working in regenerative agriculture uh, in the investing space uh, on here. So I'm really honored to be a part of it. Thank you so much for making the time this morning. And and I want to start with the usual question that I, that I always do. So why are you in this space and why are you building soil and doing what you're doing? Well, um, I think as with... Um, uh, most uh, people that have you inter- that you've interviewed, it's a very personal story. Uh, my background is not in farming. I didn't grow up on a farm. I originally studied international business and Chinese. I lived in China for three years, and it was uh, during that time that um, I uh, I became disillusioned with my degree, and um, I was looking for. Uh, maybe a deeper meaning of uh, or, or a perspective of where I'm actually going. And uh, um, so I had this um, kind of uh, crisis um, and um, I was um, not sure really which direction uh, I'm going with uh, my degree and, and where that's going to lead. And so I decided to take a time out and um, through friends uh, of the family, I was able to um, spend that time out on an organic farm in Switzerland. And um, so I completely disconnected. Not, not a bad place to be. Absolutely, yeah. It was, uh, it was really a transformative experience for me. I really dived in. I disconnected from everything, turned off my phone and, you know, um, disconnected from, from the Internet. And uh, I was just um, working on that farm every day. And... Uh, working with the soil and, and planting and growing and harvesting. And, and um, it was a new experience for me and uh, it was a really beautiful experience. Um, and so I decided I want to work in farming. And so that, that was my start um, about uh, seven years ago or eight years ago now. And um, since then, uh, that's what I've been doing. And um, after um, a couple of years working um, on several projects. Um, I uh, co-initiated uh, several agricultural projects. One of them was uh, an EU-funded uh, project. Um, I realized that uh, what what I'm longing for is actually to work in farming with my own hands and not to kind of do 
uh, agricultural projects on a on a management level. That uh, um, and and so I decided to um, do a vocational training in Switzerland to become a farmer. And uh, in Switzerland, they, they 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 take this actually quite seriously. Um, vocational training to become a farmer usually takes at least three years. Um, I did. Uh, the biodynamic education, which actually goes for four and a half years, full time, uh, working wow. on uh, different farms. And um, the way vocational trainings are set up is that 80% of the time you work on the job and 20% of the time you go to school. And uh, so for me, it was um, three weeks uh, per month uh, working on the farm and one week per month uh, going to school. And um, it was um, in, in that education that uh, I was kind of envisioning that uh, at some point in the future, I will have my own farm um, where I will have some cows and grow uh, vegetables and grains and, and also have kind of agro-tourism. I had this whole vision for this beautiful farm in my head. And um, then... When I actually started looking into um, buying a farm, um, looking for a farm that I could buy, um, it dawned on me that um, I'm not going to be able to afford that. Uh, it's really expensive uh, to buy a farm. And um, if you want to fund that through external loans from a bank and you have to pay market interest rates, there's no way you can earn um, that kind of money from agriculture. And and you were looking in one of the most expensive real estate economies on in the world, obviously. But this is a problem that is I've heard many times on on this podcast. So it seems to be a problem or a huge challenge for people that want to get into farming around the world. Yeah, I think this is a problem uh, not just in Switzerland. I know it's a problem in Germany. I know it's a problem in the U.S. Um, I'm less familiar with. Um, other countries, but um, I'm, I'm sure that this is a huge uh, barrier. And um, part of the reason is that um, a lot of um, speculative cash has moved into um, buying agricultural land and thus driving up uh, the price of land. And uh, we have seen in the past 10, 20 years a real decoupling of the actual productive value of the land from uh, the market price. So as a farmer, um, to buy land, and usually you, you finance any purchase like that uh, through an external loan. So if, if you would want to buy land, then you just grow crops normally, and um, you would want to um, pay the interest on the loan. Uh, the math just doesn't add up. So right now, most of the land purchases happening in Europe uh, are being done uh, by financial institutions who are speculatively buying land. And farmers um, are now only able to afford to lease land. So buying land is really out of the question for most farmers. And um, so this is, this is really um, an unhealthy development. And why is that unhealthy? I mean, I can imagine, but it's great to hear from somebody that's in that space. Why is it not good for a bank to buy some land and lease it, for instance, to you as a, as a young sustainable farming farmer? Uh, well, these um, asset managers um, or these funds, um, they, they, they only have one criteria, and that is the financial. And so... Um, they, they are looking to maximize um, their uh, profits. And so they're leasing out the land to whoever pays the highest lease. And um, right now, because uh, the externalities of production are simply not taken into consideration, um, right now, the person or the farmer um, or the, the, the company that farms in the least sustainable way is able to pay the highest lease because they're exploiting the soil. Um, and specifically here in, in the region where I'm at, um, it's um, actually asparagus uh, farmers that uh, are really intensively um, working the soil and uh, using excessive amounts of fertilizers. Um, they're able to pay the highest lease and um, that, that is uh, the least healthy use of the land. Whereas um, an organic farmer that has a healthy crop rotation, 
he you know he's a good steward of the land but is not able to pay the highest lease so um so obviously the, the asparagus farmer gets the land uh, for lease and um so this question of ownership and and um according to what criteria the land is leased out really determines the kind of farming that we're seeing and it's uh, one of the big big drivers uh, behind the industrialization of agriculture and so when you notice that and 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 experienced it because you just simply couldn't afford the land you wanted maybe you could afford some piece extremely far away or extremely uncomfortable as as a piece of land but the piece of land where you could farm sustainably and profitably just wasn't there what was your next step what what led to you and what you're doing now and in, in your exciting project right so um at first it was uh, frustrating um it, it, it took me a year to um kind of uh, digest that that i'm not going to be able to afford a farm how many pieces of land did you see or how many times did you try and did you do that calculation just out of curiosity i don't want to open that wound again but um, well, I, I specifically looked at uh, three different farms um, and, um, I mean, really concretely, really looking at uh, what's possible there. Um, but um, I, you know, I kept my eyes open and, and, and read about many, many different opportunities where it was clear from the beginning that's not an option. Then um, it was through a friend of mine that um, I, my eyes were opened to other possibilities, and that being community-supported agriculture, uh, where, where you don't um, necessarily need to, you know, yourself buy the land and, and run this farm, but uh, as a group together, um, you, you can do it. And um, my friend, um, he started a community-supported farm in Germany um, six years ago. Um, which is now a community of 12 to 15 people about my age, between 25 and 35, uh, running this farm. And um, they, um, at first they were actually leasing the land. And then um, two years into their project, starting this um, community supported agriculture, the owner of the farm died and the heirs, they didn't want to continue leasing the farm out. They just wanted to sell it to the highest bidder. Um, and the, the people um, who were here, including my friends, they couldn't afford it. They, they, they wouldn't have been able to afford this. So it was um, really through um, coincidence and, and, uh, and, and the initiative of the people here that um, a cooperative was founded um, that would buy the land, um, a, a non-profit uh, cooperative, and um, a very wealthy, generous person um, funded the, the, the purchase of the land here uh, through a loan um, and said, um, okay, we'll, uh, we'll secure the land in this cooperative and I, I fund it, um, but long term, uh, you guys will uh, need to um, get other people involved and invest it um, so that so that land is funded. So a kind of community ownership. And um, yeah, so uh, my my friend uh, then um, he, he knew that I was looking for for a farm uh, for for a place to um, to be, and uh, um, he asked me if I want to join them. And um, at first I was a bit hesitant because. I've been in Switzerland for a very long time and uh, I wasn't really looking at Germany. Um, uh, you know, it's a different country. Uh, but uh, I came here and I, I really fell in love with, uh, with the people here, the, the community. It just, it's just so vibrant and so, um, so full of energy um, and, and such a good spirit. So I, um, I took a chance, um, not that I had so many other options for farms, um, and, and I came here. And um, then, yeah, so what, what they were hoping, uh, what my friend was hoping is that I could help them um, to do some fundraising for the farm. So some fundraising because the, the wealthy person that, that made the loan, there wasn't enough to complete the farm. You needed other types of funding to, to get it up and running. I'm, I'm speculating here. Yeah, so let me uh, um, explain that. Um, the, that wealthy person, um, she funded the whole farm, but um, she didn't. She didn't want to do that in perpetuity. It was it was an interest-free loan, really, just so that the, this project um, can continue. 
so the land wasn't sold to the highest bidder and, and people would grow asparagus or whatever the the best lease price would be yeah. absolutely and this whole this this wonderful project here this community supported farm would uh, would have disappeared um, but um, that that person that uh, that gave that loan made it very clear that uh, it's only for a certain period of time um, which was 10 years she said she's happy to put that money in for 10 years which was um, it was 880,000 euros. It's not a, a small sum. And, um, you know, without interest, so it's very, very generous, um, but not in perpetuity. Um, the idea was that the cooperative that now owned the land um, should find investors, shareholders, people who want to become part of this community of this farm. And... Um, the people running this farm, they um, obviously they're not professional fundraisers um, and, and, you know, they're, they're running the farm and that's you know, a lot of work. It's a 12 hour day job. Um, so after um, three years, they, um, they managed to um, find a few investors, but really uh, not much. And um, so the idea was um, my idea coming in here was uh, that we run a crowd investing campaign and and do like a very big uh, publicity campaign and um, so i looked into that uh, looked at uh, providers uh, of uh, crowd in uh, crowdfunding or crowd investing platforms and uh, they were asking for very high commissions uh, seven to ten percent <laughs> yeah i know right so if, if you're raising uh, you know we're looking at raising eight hundred eighty thousand euros here and if they are asking for uh, seven to ten percent, then that's a commission um, of something like uh, seventy thousand, eighty thousand euros. It's a good business model for the platform. Yeah. It's it's a good business model, um, and I think for maybe some other campaigns, uh, you know, f that's fair enough to ask those kinds of uh, commissions. But for a farm, uh, that's really not feasible to pay that kind of commission. No, the margins aren't there. It's yeah, it's really not there. Um, even you know, even if you work really hard, uh, you can't you can't uh, uh, afford that. So we decided, okay, instead of uh, paying uh, eighty thousand uh, in commission, uh, we'll we'll uh, put up some money. And actually, I, I went to a nonprofit foundation. I, I told them uh, I want to run this crowd investing campaign, and we want to set up our own platform. Um, and uh, we need some initial funding. Whether they would be willing to support that. And um, we got a very generous donation of 30,000 euros um, to fund um, this campaign. And with that money, we set up our own crowd investing platform, uh, me and a colleague of mine who is a programmer. And um, I hired some uh, awesome people who made a very cool video. And uh, we organized a whole bunch of events. And... Uh, it was a half year um, preparation time, and then we ran the campaign, you know, as usual, 30 day crowdfunding campaign. And we exceeded really all expectations and, and raised more than 1 million euros. Wow. And just to dive into that a bit, I mean, of course, there, there's this. I, I see the crowd investing world exploding, but, but didn't see it happening yet on, on a farm level or, or let alone on a regenerative agriculture level. What, what kind of investment is this? What, what am I as a crowd investor in, in this farm? What am I getting or buying or, or what, what would be my role in the future? Right. So this is, uh, I think, um, what will uh, maybe even shock some people. So the investment uh, is, a, is a share in the cooperative that owns the land. Uh, this cooperative was started three years ago when this uh, farm was in a situation where the, the farm was being sold. Um, and by now, this cooperative has uh, also bought far, uh, land for um, other farms that are in a similar situation. Um, so the whole purpose of this cooperative is to buy land and keep it um, in, a, in a stewardship role and lease it out to the farmers long term. Um, and and to charge very very low leases to the farmers, um, so so that uh, regenerative agriculture can be practiced. Um, and as an investor, um, you buy shares in the cooperative, and um, the shares they uh, they give no dividends, um, and there's no other um, financial reward. So basically, uh, the money that you put in is the money that you um, get out uh, at some point. Uh, but actually, you um, investing, you pay a 5% management fee. So let's say you invest 10,000 euros, um, you actually only get back 9,500 um, with no interest. And you can only take the money out after five years. 
And um, if you want to take out your money, you have um, um, a period of notice of uh, usually one year. So, so let's say not, not ideal investing terms if you're looking for the highest return. Right, super unattractive. And, and yet you raised over a million. Right, so, so um, we, we saw that people are really willing to invest in something if they feel like it has an impact uh, in that, um, you know, we, we, this farm has existed for six years. So, so really they have a track record and, and people can see what's going on and that um, this, this small farm uh, which is 30 hectares, um, about 100 acres, that usually does not provide provide enough income in, in conventional agricultural terms, that it would not provide enough income for one family to live on. This farm, because it's so diverse, produces 100 different kinds of vegetables, has um, 16 milk cows, produces its own cheese, 20 different kinds of cheese, um, produces grains, produces... Uh, uh, honey and uh, raises pigs. So the, the, the diversity of it um, provides um, an income, a living for five families. So you're saying it's it's more productive. I mean, productive is a very difficult term here, but it, it provides a living for five families. And in conventional chemical agriculture, it wouldn't even be considered a farm because one family cannot live of it. Yes, it would only be considered a part time uh, kind of farm. A hobby, yeah. Yeah, somebody would have to have an external income, you know, um, to to be able to... Like most farmers in, in Europe, or at least in the Netherlands, were in a situation a bit better to have. I mean, most of the time their partner yes. is working outside the farm just to make ends meet. And they have a much bigger farm usually than the 30 hectares. Right. So that's that's a really uh, sad situation to be in that, uh, you know, you're producing food for hundreds of people, really, um, and you yourself can't make a living on that. Um, so, yeah, so this, this community supported farm um, really, um, you know, normally you would sell the milk in conventional agriculture for 30 cents a liter, right? And here, because we make the cheese um, ourselves on the milk, uh, we, we have um, this enormous value creation where, uh, in the end, uh, the, our, our revenue of one liter of milk um, is about 2 euro 70 to 3 euros per liter. Right. So we increased uh, the value creation tenfold um, through um, creating products directly on the farm. Now, this I think, um, you know, we, we, we tried to communicate this and show this in the video um, and, and showed, you know, the way we treat the animals and the soil and, and that we're composting. Um, this really touched a lot of people and um, they put their money where their heart is and invested in this. So out of this, um, the idea was um, born... To raise one million every week. <laughs> uh, where's the limit in that? Right, so yeah, where's the limit? So the idea was born that we, uh, we, we, we make a, a better crowd investing platform um, and um, that we, we make that open source available to to the whole world that other people can kind of replicate uh, this campaign that we did here that we showed you know it's possible because there are many more of these super diverse relatively small at least idea farms there are many also actually active but of course many others that that have the the knowledge to do it but don't have the land so they might be able to get this type of investment donation to actually buy land and 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 do it is that what you i mean there's there's but then the question is how far how many donations or this type of very unattractive investments are there to, to buy the land? Or is there some at some point a point that it actually becomes a commercial investment? Right. So we, we tried to um, figure out the numbers on that. And, and we thought that, um, you know, maybe 10 percent, 20 percent of people are willing um, or um, I think, you know, a lot of people, they, they, they're looking for um, a place to put their money that they you know feel that it has an impact um, so we thought maybe 20 percent of people in germany uh, are willing to take money uh, into their hands uh, and invest it in something like this and maybe uh, those people would be willing to take um, 20 uh, 10 10 percent of their liquid assets so if we kind of make this really rough calculation then um, there is several billion euros uh, in capital available that um um, we could potentially tap into. So we thought, yeah, um, this, this really does have potential. And, and um, right now we're, uh, we're actually, um, uh, we started working on um, a really professional crowd investing platform specifically for 
regenerative farms, um, more specifically for uh, community supported farms, which are ideally suited for uh, this kind of crowd investing campaign because they already have a community. The community supported farms, they're already producing for um, usually between 100, 200 or even 300 uh, households. So there, um, if they run a campaign, then they already have this established network that uh, can propagate it. And, and they would run a campaign to to grow or to extend or maybe to buy the land that's underneath them. If exactly. To, to really buy the land and then secure it long term uh, because a, a lot of farms they lease land so that's that's a pretty um, insecure situation even though leases you know they might run for 10 years yeah but still you're building soil especially if you farm in this way and you're you're i'm, I'm saying between brackets you're giving it away after 10 years it's it's a huge value creation plus you have to restart again somewhere else exactly so uh, we think there's huge uh, potential here and also um having done the biodynamic education as a farmer myself I saw from uh, my peers that 80% of them who invested four and a half years of their life to learn farming, 80% didn't find a farm, you know? So um, we have this young generation of farmers who are willing to really dedicate their life to sustainable farming and are, you know, put their whole hearts and souls into it, are super passionate about it, uh, but then um, end up working in some other field because they don't have the capital to uh, take over a farm or set up a farm. You know, so, so that as a, that's, that's really as a background uh, for uh, now what turned out to be the next uh, bigger project, uh, which is running parallel to uh, the crowd investing platform, which is um, a blockchain land trust framework. Yeah, you do have to explain it a bit because people use blockchain uh, everywhere, but it's it's often uh, not super relevant or or way too vague. And in this case, it's absolutely not. So it would be great to to dive into that and why that could be so important and why it could be part of a solution against the speculation and give young sustainable farmers or not young sustainable farmers, but sustainable farmers in general access to the land they they might deserve. Right. Um... So the, um, I have um, known many people who have dealt with blockchain the past few years, um, either working on startups or they had invested. And so I knew a little bit about the technology, but uh, I was actually quite skeptical just uh, of Bitcoin specifically, uh, knowing of uh, not knowing about the, the energy uh, consumption that's involved with running uh, the system, I, I thought like that's really not uh, something sustainable. It's not something I want to be involved with. So it was uh, only late last year that um, when I was uh, in the middle of running this um, crowd investing campaign and um, setting up this platform that these, these dots started to connect where I actually saw a real use case for blockchain that made sense to me. And um, that is that we, um, instead of, you know, issuing the shares, what I explained before, we, we issue shares in the cooperative, that is a super attractive investment and um, quite cumbersome, you know, which, with each investor, you have to sign contracts and uh, you have to, you know, really issue these shares and send them to them and so on. And, and we live in 2018, so that should be, there should be a better way. Right. I mean, we, we, we were really using um, kind of uh, tools that uh, were out of the 19th century here. So um, I thought um, that, that why, you know, we, we're having, you know, these, these people who are investing literally billions um, of um, dollars in uh, cryptocurrencies. Well, why don't we create a cryptocurrency and, and issue this cryptocurrency and then raise funds with that and invest that money into land? And then um, the, the cryptocurrency is actually backed in value by something real, namely agricultural land. So um, it, it just so happened that um, in, in, in the same time frame, um, the Swiss Financial Regulatory uh, Market Authority um, issued its guidelines uh, dealing uh, or issued its guidelines on how to how it's dealing with um, these new cryptocurrencies and classifying them 
and really um, giving legal security to investors. And um, so I thought there's a real opportunity here to um, really basically digitize the whole process of issuing shares and raising funds. And um, what I think is um, really attractive here, especially for um, cryptocurrency investors, is um, a lot of there's a there's a huge amount of volatility in the market. Uh, Bitcoin is going up twenty uh, percent one day and uh, down twenty uh, percent the next. Uh, you know, there's fluctuations of ten fifteen percent within minutes, and so this is um, uh, really you can't use this as as a means of payment when you know from one minute to, uh, to the next the value of this of the cryptocurrency um, varies so much. And so there have been several initiatives in the in the cryptocurrency um, space to create a stable value cryptocurrency. Uh, the most well known, or the one with the highest um, market capitalization, is Tether, which um, is supposedly backed one to one by U.S. dollars. So people buy this cryptocurrency called um, Tether. And they take the money um, that is invested and they put it in a bank account. And supposedly every uh, dollar of um, Tether cryptocurrency is backed by one dollar of, um, well, one US dollar that is uh, in a safe uh, bank account. Now, there are several issues with, with Tether. Um, they, they haven't had any transparent um, auditing. Now, I would, I would argue for the listeners to Google it and, and see what comes up. Because for sure, when, I, when this is published, there will be another round of, uh, right. of, of controversy around them. Right. So it's, it's quite controversial. There's, there's a little transparency. And um, so the thought um, was that, you know, we can, uh, if, if we want to set this up as a nonprofit initiative, uh, where um, this um, Terrafina, we called it, um, this uh, Terrafina framework is owned by a nonprofit that issues the tokens and uh, raises the capital and then uh, takes that money in, and invests it in farmland stewardship organizations. So just one step back. So invested in farmland stewardship organizations, or as, as you also call them, FSOs? Uh, yes. Does that mean you're buying you're buying the land for these high prices and basically helping the the speculation or what what does investing in this case mean? How do you get access to the land if you don't want to fuel the engine of speculation? Well, uh, I'm glad you you mentioned that because uh, that is um, a, a real a point of um, contention. Um, but the fact is uh, that you know we we can you know the only way we um, can secure the land for sustainable use um, is to buy it. You know, we, we can't disown people, right? Uh, we, we're not living in a communist state. No, maybe not. Yeah. Um, so the only um, tool we have available is to compete uh, on the market and, and, uh, and, and buy the land. What we have seen uh, with this cooperative that um, has bought the land uh, for the farm where I'm at and has now bought land for 10 other farms and there's uh, several other organizations like this um, operational in Germany and in France, and Belgium. We have um, seen that people are willing to sell the land uh, for a fairer price if they know if they know that the land is then going to be used in a sustainable way. So that's very interesting. So you can actually get a discount because you're operating or you're going to operate or because they have seen that you operate in other places sustainably. Yes. Which means that, which is a huge thing if you think about it. I mean, it's the same level as Danone now. I mean, the news, I think, broke a few weeks ago that they will pay less on their, their huge line of credit with a number of banks. They will play, pay less if their ESG and their sustainability measures, if they, they score high on that. So actually their cost of capital is less if they are more sustainable. In this case, you're saying that in, in some cases you've seen that the cost of land access are less if you can operate it sustainably. That's very interesting. Yes, um, that I think that's very encouraging. Um, and necessary. Well, necessary um, to some extent. In the end, you know, um, it, it is a fact that uh, land prices uh, have gone up substantially in the last um, 
especially in the last 20 years. Uh, in, the, in, in, in Germany, well, I can give you specific numbers for the last 10 years. Yeah. So in the, in the past 10 years, land prices in, in, in Germany have gone up 150%. Uh, in uh, neighboring Poland, prices have gone up 700%. In Romania, they've gone up 800%. So it's really, really dramatic, quite dramatic. Um, and uh, there's you know, nothing a, a farmland stewardship organization can do about these market dynamics. Um, the only thing we can do is um, to make sure that we buy the land and then um, it's secured uh, in, for the long term. Yeah, because that's the crux, right? That's the long term part, because, of course, if you buy it, you cannot hold on to it and you're forced to sell at some point again when the organization has a, a cash flow problem or one of the harvests fails. You, you're still in the same in the same issues. Well, um, you're not facing the same kind of financial pressure um, if you are not promising investors a return, right? Um, uh, as uh, Kulturlandgenossen, Jeff, the cooperative that has bought the land here, um, they they are not under the, the pressure um, that uh, they have to produce a certain percentage in return. Um, they can finance their operational costs through the low leases uh, that they charge the farmers. And really, an organization like that doesn't have a huge overhead. You know, they just, you know, they have to manage the legal stuff. They have to purchase the land. Uh, it has to be uh, administered and uh, the leases have to be um, um, signed and so on. But other than that, it's not um, such a huge uh, admin um, expense. Um, and if you don't have investors that are then expecting returns, then um, really the land... You have time, basically. Right. So you're not taking up bank loans. You have investors in there um, who, um, who put their money in and uh, are not expecting a return. But as we discussed earlier, there, there are some limitations to that. And actually one of the um, critical um, limitations is that, well, let's say that um, at one point in the future, all of the shareholders um, would say, um, uh, okay, the, the value of the land has increased several times, uh, a few hundred percent. Um, okay, we, we all vote uh, to sell the land now. And because, um, you know, that's the democratic uh, structure of uh, such an organization, um, there's really nothing you could do, you know. Um, so um, it's really not 100% secure. You know, you're really counting on the goodwill and the idealism of the people who are part of it. Which, which at the beginning, probably everybody is aligned, but of course things change. And if somebody comes in and offers a lot of money for the land, for whatever reason, to either grow asparagus or make it a golf course, right? it could be interesting for more than half of the cooperative owners to, at some point, take some money off the table. Yeah. Right. And um, that usually is you know, what happens with farms in the second or third generation. You know, the people who, who were running the farm, and here I'm thinking of the people who invested, you know, they're so idealistic, they would never do that. But let's think one generation down the line, um, they inherit these shares, you know, they have no personal connection to this anymore. And then uh, then you're really facing danger. So how, how do you get around that? Well, there's um, a very uh, interesting model also in Germany um, by a syndicate um, that... Um, has found a legal way to get around this in that um, so they're doing this for real estate for housing and um, there's okay how can i put this really simply um don't worry if it's not simple i will ask a question right so okay um there's this this uh, central uh, non-profit entity and that entity holds a golden share in all other legal entities which in this case would be the the cooperative okay um, and, and with that golden share, it has a veto right, a very specified veto right um, that um, gives it the veto right on the sale of, of properties. So um, even if you know, the organization, uh, the cooperative, would want to sell land, the central nonprofit entity, whose sole purpose is to hold these shares, these, these veto shares, um, can you know, then say, no, we veto that, and then, you know, you can't sell the land again for for speculative purposes. So, so this organization could theoretically hold a hundred thousand veto shares of a hundred thousand different projects, right? And the sole purpose is to the only thing they can veto, just to be clear, is when 
there is a potential sale. They cannot veto and anything else on, on the daily operation. The cooperatives completely manage that. Absolutely. But as soon as somebody comes with a huge bag of money and puts it on the table, then this uh, the veto right could be used to to basically block that sale of land because in in the initial it was meant to be a long term project and long term means not selling. Exactly. That that is exactly what it is. Um, so. Um, this, you know, veto, it sounds kind of scary, but really this, the veto is only uh, to ensure that um, the, the original idea, ideals of the, the projects, which in that case, uh, the, the meat toys are syndicate, um, those are housing projects, um, which follow the... Like co-living, uh, like co-living housing and, and things like that, like a bit more, like the, the new type of, of cooperatives owning uh, social housing, etc. Exactly. Or, or what kind of yes. living? Not, not fancy penthouses, I imagine. No, not at all. So they're, they're all like kind of uh, co-living kind of uh, projects. And uh, there's uh, currently 140 of these uh, housing projects in Germany, um, uh, which are part of this um, network where the, the central entity, the Mietshäuser Syndicat, holds a veto share. And um, all but one project uh, so far has been a success. Uh, it's been going on for 30 years now. One of them has filed for bankruptcy. And the, the case where you have a bankruptcy, that is actually the only uh, time when a property would be sold. So um, if, if, if a project uh, cannot fund its operational expenses anymore, it, you know, it goes bankrupt, then you still actually have the underlying asset, which is the property. And so investors are still... Um, at least to some extent protected, um, depending on what state um, the real estate is in, it is sold on the market, and then in investors are paid out proportionally. And in, in such a case, of course, um, the um, central entity, the Mitzvah Syndicat, allows for the sale. And I would even see that actually, because of this, me as an idealistic investor at the beginning are more likely to do it because I know that maybe when I um, I know I'm no longer there. My shares are maybe owned by my children or grandchildren, etc. At least it's always protected the reason why I did this. Exactly right. Uh, that's 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 the whole idea of it, you know. So that it's it, it is protected over many many generations. So how do you put this to work in 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 land and and what what does the blockchain have to do with that? Because they have been doing it for thirty years in in real estate, meaning that it's also possible on paper. But I can imagine it's difficult. Right, it is possible, um, but um, it's uh, it, it's been very um, uh, cumbersome, uh, I would um, say, to, to to raise the uh, the funds for each individual project. And um, the way we want to implement it, in terms of the legal framework, we want to adopt that. Um, that's uh, that's um, a framework that has been proven by time and um, and it works and uh, you know so we want to build on something that works and the blockchain comes in uh, um, in that it allows for uh, much larger amounts of capital to be raised in that um, the foundation why, why is that why, why would it be much larger because there's so much money going around tokens at the moment or in general Right, uh, because there is, uh, on the one hand, um, well, it's much uh, easier to invest um, in in a cryptocurrency than to uh, to go and sign contracts and um, and to buy shares. Right, uh, that's a very cumbersome process. Whereas investing in in tokens, um, you can very easily just basically go online and pay by credit card. So anybody could do it, basically. Any, yeah. any, anyone can do it. Um, so they, that's kind of speaking to the existing crowd that um, is investing in these kinds of projects. So it's basically just a much easier way to enable that. But at the same time, um, cryptocurrency investors, and there's literally hundreds of billions of uh, dollars in assets in, in cryptocurrencies out there, um, because there's this huge uh, volatility in the cryptocurrency market, we um, can offer um, a value-backed, stable cryptocurrency as a portfolio uh, diversification for these uh, cryptocurrency investors. So they can take, um, you know, some of the money that they hold in Bitcoin and Ether and in other cryptocurrencies, and um, put it into our Terrafina uh, coins and be sure that uh, it's backed in value because it's invested 
um, in land. And um, we think that it's, uh, it's a much more attractive proposition than, for example, Tether, uh, where the money is um, put in a bank. And for Tether specifically, th their bank is in, in Taiwan. Um, and Taiwan actually doesn't have um, um, a legal framework that protects investors uh, for, for cryptocurrencies. Um, whereas Switzerland actually um, has now clear legal boundaries, legal guidelines um, that uh, protect cryptocurrency investors uh, when the cryptocurrency is um, asset backed, then it's treated as a security, just like um, a share of a company. And so we have to um, adhere to all of the very, very strict uh, auditing um, and, and legal regulations in place in Switzerland. And thus, uh, investors can be sure that the money that they put in there um, is, uh, is secure. So we can tap into this huge um, uh, pool of money and, and, and use that to um, really do something good instead of, you know, just having that money lying on, 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 on some bank account for some people who, who knows what they're doing with it, right? No, I, I, I can imagine what they're doing with it. Um, for sure, not buying hectares of land and leasing it out to sustainable farmers. Right. So, so where would you be buying? So I'm, I'm buying these tokens and, and we're not going to go into all the technical details. I, I will definitely post a link to the project in, in the description. But so I'm, I'm buying the tokens. Where would Terrafina buy the land? Is that Switzerland then bound because you're there? Or is it much more freely like it could also be Germany or France or, or even further, further abroad? Yeah, so we are uh, really looking um at first at Germany and France, um, because there's uh, these very well-established um, farmland stewardship organizations that um, have the three that um, I'm, I'm looking at, Terre des Liens uh, in France, um, that has existed for 10 years and been implementing this model of buying land um, and, uh, through, uh, and raising money through issued uh, shares that offer no return. So you would be partnering with, with the, with already established farmland stewardship organizations and helping them basically to, to grow. Right, exactly. So we would um, raise the capital through the issued tokens and then invest in those existing organizations that uh, have a very, very solid track record. And, and those three organizations I'm looking at, the bio boden Genossenschaft in Germany, Kulturland Genossenschaft in Germany, Kulturland Genossenschaft I have a very close relationship with and the board of directors has approved uh, to, to, to be part of this from the beginning. So I already have one organization that is partnering and Terre de Lyon in France. Um, they together they have invested more than 100 million euros in land. So we would uh, invest in those organizations. We would The money that we raise, we invest directly in those organizations and um, through this legal framework uh, of uh, veto right on the sale of land and um, a, a right of first refusal um, if land would, um, under um, some circumstances, in the case of bankruptcy, have to be sold. Um, we would... Um, ask these organizations to give us, as a, as a non-profit organization, a right of first refusal to purchase the land so that even if an organization would go bankrupt, it's still protected. And you still get the, the chance to buy it and, and make sure it stays in the sustained, and all the soil you've built is, is lost, if they've built is lost. Yeah. Right, and, and, and that the asset actually still stays within the framework and is, is still backing the, um, the cryptocurrency in its value, right? So, um, so we would just invest in those organizations rather than uh, buy land ourselves, um, which um, we think would be um, an unhealthy concentration of power. You know, if, if, if one organization would raise billions and billions billion, uh, yeah. and, and, and we, would, we would manage all this land, then, um, you know, we don't, uh, we, we, we don't necessarily have the know-how um, of, of uh, you know, the local uh, on the ground know-how who, you know, should, uh, who are the actors that uh, would be able to manage the land sustainably and so on. Um, and, and there are literally hundreds of these uh, farmland stewardship organizations in the world, um, in, in many, many countries, um, in, Australia and Belgium and in the US there's many so um, we can work with them and um, really play the role of um, raising uh, the capital and then um, investing it uh, very locally in many 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 different organizations um, and thus make sure that um, they 
locally know who to who the farmers are, who they want to work with, who 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 is then really able to uh, manage the land in a way that is really sustainable long term. And and as a token investor, can I choose where my money goes, and and what do I get in in return? As far as you know now, I mean, this project started in December. It's it's all much in process and, and fluid, but what's your, what are your thoughts at this moment, 30th of March, 2018? Yeah. Uh, yeah. As you say, it's, it's early on, but uh, we uh, do have um, ideas of uh, what we want to implement in the future. Um, some of it is uh, not technically feasible at this point. So it, in the beginning, um, as an investor, um, the money is managed by Terrafina, and uh, we then invest the money in in the different farmland stewardship organizations. But the idea is that in the future, we would be able to uh, put in place smart contracts where um, as an investor, you could um, dedicate funds um, and, and say that the money that you invest uh, should be specifically dedicated to this or that organization or farm. Um, that is one um, line of thought. And the other um, vision is that um, we in the future will establish our own blockchain and we will establish an ICO platform specifically for these farmland stewardship organizations that they can also um, issue tokens themselves. Now, that only makes sense at a certain size of the organization because um, it, it does co cost a certain uh, amount of money. It costs about $100,000 uh, to be listed um, on, a, on the token exchange. And uh, to issue tokens as a security, you have to fulfill um, strict requirements. Uh, you have to issue a prospectus and so on. And uh, that all, all costs uh, a lot of money. But um, at a certain size uh, of, of an organization, it, it, it would make sense that they can issue their own tokens. Um, so then we would provide uh, the infra infrastructure for them to do that. And then people could uh, invest directly in those organizations. And we would uh, invest in those organizations uh, through tokens instead of um, classical um, shares, the way we would be doing in the beginning. Now, as an investor, um, what you get is a stable value cryptocurrency. Now, that uh, might not sound super attractive. Um, we, we're not envisioning, well, we have been thinking about um, returns. Uh, you know, do we want to offer investors a return? And we... Um, Which would potentially make the market you're, you're fishing in much bigger, as, as many people are currently getting maybe zero on their savings accounts or even in, in some parts of Switzerland minus. Um, so it, there's even if you do one or two percent, it already becomes a, it becomes an investment instead of um, looking for a stable, stable currency. But of course, it brings a whole different suite of, of problems with it. Yeah. And um, this really is, 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 is uh, an ideological debate to some extent uh, in that you know, the only way we could um, offer these returns is if we inc um, take into account the increase in uh, market value of the land. But really, the whole idea of this framework is uh, to decommoditize land, to take the land off the market for good, forever. You know, we don't want to sell it again. So the money is to be made on the land, not with the land. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so, so um, that's, uh, that's uh, in, in, in a, it, it's, it's a bit of a conflict of ideals um, to think uh, about offering um, a return on the increase in the value. So uh, we are, we're um, tending towards um, saying um, we, we, we do not want to um, incorporate uh, or we do not want to pass on the increase in the value of the land to the uh, investors um, because we want to be clear, you know, we don't want to sell the land again. So uh, any, any profits, um, uh, so to say, that would arise from the increase in the value wouldn't be realized, right, because the land wouldn't be sold. So it's really, um, it, it would be a contradiction to, to do that. But we think that looking at um, other stable value cryptocurrencies like Tether, they have um, in the past 12 months uh, raised more than 2 billion 
US dollars. Because the price of a stable currency could rise because there's a bigger need of a stable currency, not necessarily because the value of the dollar, in this case of the tether or the, uh, the, the hectare of land is increasing, but just the fact that there is a stable currency could become more attractive and more people want it. That, that's what you're saying. But we, we don't want to, uh, we want to keep it stable in the sense that we want to peg it to US dollar or euro. So if the demand is great, you know, we, uh, we get a lot of uh, capital inflow, but we won't let the currency go up. You know, we just keep issuing new tokens. Okay, yeah. yeah. You were able to raise a million on, on very unattractive terms. So there's, there's definitely money in the market, especially if it becomes a stable coin to, to I mean, it, it's part of a portfolio. Now, it could be that, um, you know, if we're looking really long term, let's say 20, 30, 50, 60 years, and let's say um, the Terrafina tokens, they become... Uh, a mainstream everyday currency, you know, you're, you're, you're walking down the street in Burkina Faso and, and you're seeing, uh, you know, your loaf of bread uh, in uh, Terrafina um, tokens, right? Uh, um, then, then, then we could actually, you know, uh, use uh, the tokens to buy land directly, you know, then, then you're not kind of uh, going through, you know, this peg anymore, peg to the euro or whatever, you know, who knows what happens to the euro in 20 years or even in 10 years. So, uh, or if, if we were in a situation where we would have um, hyperinflation, for example, let's say the euro completely loses its value, you know, we, we still have um, our land, right? So um, the value is still there. So then we could um, readjust the value that um, it, 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 it keeps its value. You know what I mean? Uh, right now, the, the inflation rate is like maybe 1% to 2%. So nobody uh, is, is thinking along these lines. But if you have an inflation uh, of 20% or even hyperinflation like they have in Venezuela, um, all of this could, could happen. You know, we've seen it um, uh, historically happen many times. Then at least our uh, cryptocurrency is backed by a real asset. And um, then we could account for inflation and, and, and price that into the token and, and, and pass that on to the investors. And, and we still have to eat. So at the end of the day, um, where would you like your money or your value be, be stored or be, be hold? Um, and where would be where would value be created, which probably comes out of the land, right? And probably a piece of the sea, right? At the end of the day, you know, uh, the land is, is is the ultimate scarce resource. Um, it's it's um, it's better than the gold standard, right? I mean, a currency backed by land, um, that's uh, the safest uh, thing you could uh, think of. Uh, if you can find people that can can work the land in a in a proper way, absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's really the grand vision. Um, and uh, maybe uh, one other aspect that I haven't mentioned so far is that uh, we also want to um, set up a global uh, blockchain land registry. Um, so of course, um, right now, um, you know, every country uh, has their own land registry. Uh, so we would set that up uh, parallel to the uh, nation state land registry and um, import all of the information uh, on uh, land ownership and uh, lease rights and so on into the global um, blockchain land registry so that we have absolute uh, transparency on uh, the ownership um, and, and the assets and, and the, the land use rights and so on um, so that there can be real uh, trust in this uh, framework. And just to also be conscious of, of, of your time, I want to ask and uh, end with one final question. We have much more to cover. I think we could do another hour on on just this one you just mentioned, but I think that we'll keep that for another podcast. Sure. Um, let's imagine there's a, a theater full of smart impact investors listening to this podcast, and they're they're on board. They're thinking, I, I need to get into regenerative agriculture. I need to be able to support these farmland stewardship organizations. I I want to either buy land or make land accessible, or invest in infrastructure, or invest in in um, a machinery, what would your advice be um, for smart investor, smart impact investors to, to get into regenerative agriculture? Where, where to start? What would be your first steps um, if they don't want to do a four and a half year biodynamic farmer training? <laughs> right. Well, um, I think there is um, quite a few um, of these farmland stewardship organizations um, all over the world. Um, I know of many in Europe. I know in, in, in the US, in Australia. So um, those are actually not so difficult to find. Um, there is um, 
I forget what the network is called in the US. Uh, they have a network of, of 500 of these organizations. Um, so um, I, I think everyone can, can find one that is geographically close to them or um, uh, pursues goals that is uh, uh, really aligning specifically with, with their values. So um, I think that is um, a, a fantastic investment. Or um, community-supported farming is really taking off and has, has been taking off in the U.S. for 20 years and in Europe the past 10 years. There's uh, more than 10,000 community supported farms in the US. There's um, some 2,000 in France and then some 300 in Germany. And most of those farms, they rely on, on loans to fund their, um, to, to pay for tractors and, and uh, the operations. Yeah. Right. So uh, you, you could probably find one of these community supported farms in your region and um, go to them and say, look, um, okay, you've got a bank loan, you're paying 3%, whatever. Um, uh, I'm not getting a good return on, on the money I have on the bank. Let's, how about I, I lend you the money directly and we, we, uh, you know, we cut it in the middle and I take one and a half percent, something like that. And they would be happy and, and you would know that your money is uh, financing something uh, positive. And yeah, that, I think that, uh, that, that would have a huge impact. Um, and one, I always say final question and then I have another 10. Um, in this case, only one. In, with these CSAs that, that have been popping up everywhere and you're actually involved in one, um, do you see that it's now getting to a scale? And by scale, I don't mean that they need to manage 300,000 hectares, etc., but to a scale and also to a price point that it starts to be accessible um, for not just the happy few like does it get to a a level where um accessibility of food becomes um, because it's a huge issue obviously if you cannot afford it you end up in the cheaper aisle in the supermarket and probably not the most nutritious and, and the healthiest especially for the soil and you do you see that there's a change going on that it's coming out of the niche and hopefully slowly to to slightly more more accessible and masses or we still need to go through another generation to get there. Right. Well, I think this is um, would be a whole other podcast on just this. Uh, but uh, I, I would uh, sum it Let's up. Let's do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would sum up uh, to say that um, I think generally um, food is unrealistically cheap. Uh, the way uh, the way we uh, it's priced in the supermarket because uh, a lot of the external costs are not taken account for, um, and. Um, these, these CSAs, uh, specifically the ones I know, um, okay, they are um, on average um, more expensive than um, the supermarket uh, food. Um, but if you were to um, not be able to afford it, like for example, the, the CSA where I'm at, um, we leave it up to our members to decide how much they want to pay. So we know, you know, on average, we, we get a certain amount, which is uh, a higher price in the supermarket. But um, some members, they pay considerably less and some, some pay more. So there is a solidarity amongst um, this community. And, and this is what I've observed uh, on, on many of these CSAs. And um, some of the members, they really can't afford it. And then um, they uh, help out on the farm. Uh, we have some members, they come. Uh, once or twice a week, and they help out with with their labor and pay for the food through that. So um, really, I think nobody is 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 excluded um, on um, economic terms. No, that's the important thing, and, and let's dive into that in an, in another podcast. Thomas, I want to thank you so much. This is probably the longest podcast I've ever recorded, and um, definitely let's check in. Let's dive deep into a few of the other topics, and also let's keep. Checking in on, on Terafina. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep it up with your fantastic work. Uh, looking forward to hearing more of your podcast. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of this very long podcast. Probably the longest I did so far. I really enjoyed diving deeper into land prices and access and hope to explore some of the things we've raised here in future podcasts. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, 
If this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you and I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you if this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, Uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.